Hi, everyone. My name is Lindsay Ashworth. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am the Sexual Violence Response Manager at the Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence. Um, I have two co-presenters today, um, if you all want to introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Lachey Brown. I use she and her pronouns. Um, I am one of the Sexual Violence Response Coordinators here at the Coalition. And hi, this is Victoria Reekers. Uh, I also use she, her pronouns, and I'm also a sexual violence response coordinator at the coalition. So we are hosting this webinar um, to talk about how to provide virtual emotional support during COVID-19. Some of you all might remember we did host um, a similar conversation um, about a week or two ago. Um, and we did not record it. So we're gonna go ahead and record this one so we all can look back on it for those of um, for those of you that weren't able to attend the conversation we all had um, as a team and as advocates. Um, so I just wanna start by saying that, you know, COVID-19 is really changing the way we do services, the way we do outreach, the way we take care of ourselves. Um, and so this um, webinar, this conversation between Victoria Lachey and I, um, is really meant to provide some guidance and support and reassurance um, that emotional support is really important um, and that sometimes survivors, um, what they need is someone to hear them and someone to listen to them. And that's something, that's a service that we provide as advocates. So, um, you know, you all are doing awesome. Um, you are doing enough. Um, if, you, if you think you're just providing emotional support, um, oftentimes that is what the what survivors need. Um, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Next slide, please, Lachey. So the first, the, these first few slides might be a review for some of us, um, but I think it's a really good, um, some good reminders to ground us in this work and to, to center us, um, and just some good reminders during this time. So um, we wanna make sure that when we're providing emotional support, um, we need to be prepared for any type of emotion, right? So, so our emotions as advocates um, can guide the survivor's emotion. So, you know, if we're feeling anxious, if we're feeling overwhelmed, um, the, the survivor might pick up on that, right? The clients that we work with might pick up on that. Um, so it's important for us to take care of ourselves um, and for us to engage in quality self-care for us to provide really high quality services. Um, so this is a, a gentle reminder for, for everyone to take care of themselves during this time. Um, it's, important, it's important for us to be open-minded and to be attentive. So, so that really requires um, that, that deep listening um, uh, with, with clients. Next slide. So again, so one of, one of the key things that, that we provide as advocates um, is being able to listen, right? So it's our job to listen deeply for the needs of clients. Um, and again, I'm gonna tell, you know, we're gonna say this a few times, it might be to listen, right? And, and that's a service that we can provide. So it's important for us to stay regulated and stay calm. Um, and again, take care of ourselves so we can provide that, um, the, the highest quality of advocacy that we can during this time, right? All right, next slide. It's also important for us, us to be conscious of our tone. So we wanna make sure that our tone is even, calm, and low. So, you know, if survivors, if clients that we're working with can't see us, um, it, it might be hard to, to pick up on the energy, right? And so we wanna make sure that, that we're um, speaking um, in a, a calm um, and even-toned way um, to, to relay that, that calmness and that sense of um, empathy and compassion. So we wanna be serious and concerned, right? Again, that, that compassionate piece. And we wanna remember to respond in a non-judgmental manner. Um, and so this one, you know, again, we're all human um, and we have to, to make sure that the, the, the tone in how we're responding to other folks um, doesn't come off as non-judgmental. So we have to be extra cautious of that. Next slide. 
We want to engage in active listening as advocates, right? We want to listen with empathy. We want to be patient. And we definitely want to spend more time listening and than speaking. So, um, you know, you, you all will see during this webinar that um, oftentimes as advocates, we really want to provide solutions, right, to, to some of those tangible things. Um, but this webinar is more about um, how to provide that emotional validation and emotional support and, um, I, you know, I think really the only um, tangibles that we're going to provide you all are some of those skills um, and some of those skills to help yourselves and survivors um, kind of ground um, during this time. Next slide. So, um, hi again, this is Lachey. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some virtual advocacy guidelines. And again, um, we're going to probably see this several more times throughout the webinar, but context is everything. So we should be altering and changing this um, to every caller that we have. And for every advocate um, that is providing this virtual advocacy, it should look different. Uh, but here are some general things that you could follow to help keep yourself um, grounded and providing the best advocacy that we can. Um, so there shouldn't be a suggested time limit for calls. Um, when people are seeking that emotional validation, it could take 10 minutes for some people to become regulated and grounded and get everything they need. And for others, it can take an hour, but um, we should just make sure that we're giving people that space to get what they need um, and however long that may take. And this is also why um, we stray away from sample scripts because that doesn't work for everyone, right? We don't wanna go ahead and make it seem very formulaic when someone's calling and people can tell when you're just reading from a script. So we wanna make sure that we are making sure it's adaptable and it's tailored to everyone who's calling to receive services. Um, and then we also wanna remember that there are different types of safety plans. Um, we know for a lot of Domestic violence advocates are really good at doing those physical safety plans, so finding those tangible needs and helping survivors work through that. But we also want to make sure that we're doing really well in implementing those things about um, coping plans and coping skills and trigger plans in that too, and making sure that those are all together because we want to make sure that the survivor is feeling safe holistically, um, not just taking care of their physical needs. And so just like we have um, the guidelines of a virtual advocate, we have roles, right? Um, they're very similar to that, what you expect of other advocates, but we wanted to highlight a couple. Um, so developing coping skills and trigger plans are very essential during this time, right? Um, a lot of our the people who are calling might be experiencing more isolation and anxiety that they have during the time of COVID-19. So we want to make sure that we're developing these skills and we're working with survivors to see what can help them feel safe, um, not only physically, but in their bodies and their minds. Um, we also want to make sure that we are providing remote accompaniment um, as needed in our agencies. So we know that some agencies during this time are responding um, remotely. Um, and so we need to have conversations at our agencies about what this might look like, um, how are we going to continue to provide court and medical advocacy if we're not going to be there in person. Um, we also want to make sure that we're assisting survivors with um, accessing healing practices if possible. So we know a lot of our um, regular services and resources have changed during this time because of COVID. Um, so we just want to make sure that we're that when they're available, we're still offering these to survivors um, so they can find these resources if they should need them. Um, we're making sure that we're still doing um, our consent and intake services as best we can. Um, so that might mean talking and having conversations at your agency about verbal consent or um, getting digital consent and seeing what that looks like when usually um, you go through the process of doing um, getting consent through uh, a written signature. So again, that might look like a conversation at your agency and with leadership. Um, and we also, as always, want to make sure that we're assisting survivors with getting their basic needs, and um, that might be through the referral process. Uh, like I touched on a little bit earlier, we know that um, some of these needs and resources have changed because of COVID. Um, so maybe this might look like throughout your agency assigning each person to look up a different type of need. So this might look like Lindsay um, looking up food resources in the Valley for survivors. Um, this might look like Victoria looking up how our digital resources have changed. This might be me looking up um, 
what resources are available for childcare. So again, maybe assigning people to those different resources can help us still keep track and keep our referrals um, current. So how do we provide this emotional validation though? What does that look like? What does that sound like? What does that um, feel like for survivors? Um, so again, it looks different for everyone, but we wanted to give you all some tangible skills and some things you could say um, to provide this validation. But the most important things are to believe survivors, right? So we are not investigators. Um, we are not um, police officers, so we don't have to worry. Um, and it's not our role to delineate whether someone's telling the truth. Our role is to believe survivors on what they're telling us and what they're showing us. We're also not there to provide judgment. So we can't tell someone whether their actions or their feelings or opinions are wrong. What we're there to do is provide um, non-judgmental support to them and assist them in whatever way and, and, and help provide them with whatever resources that we can. We're also there to validate them, right? We have no control over how someone makes it through their day or how someone feels about a certain situation. And COVID-19 is like something we've never seen before. So it's our role to validate how they're feeling, um, even if it's not how we ourselves might feel. And that's okay. Our role there, again, is to believe and validate um, how they're making it through their day. And most importantly, if we're listening, we're able to do the rest of these things. And when we're listening, we want to make sure that we are taking what they're saying and actually um, doing that deeper listening, right? So that means that we're listening and we're also providing that emotional support they're needing rather just hearing them to respond to the problem that we think they're telling us. So how do we show that empathetic response? Um, for everyone, this can look differently, but we just have this sample script that we think works best for um, on, your, on doing the foundation, right? Um, and if you want to do this activity in an expanded version, please come to Sexual Violence Core Advocacy Training um, when we offer it and we do a whole section on this. Um, but for some people, it sounds like repeating back to them what they said and then asking more questions, again, doing that deeper listening. So it might look like, it sounds like you felt anxious because when you are um, at home, your brother always slams the doors. Um, and I heard that you valued safety and security. Again, we have to respond to whatever the caller is telling us. And it's okay if you're not sure exactly what information you're getting to ask questions about that. So how did that make you feel? What made you feel that way? Um, I didn't understand when you said that um, your brother uh, makes you feel um, a bit loopy. Can you tell me more about that? Again, asking questions and these empathetic responses mean that you're not only listening um, on a surface level, but you're digging a little deeper to see uh, what else is going on to get the better picture. So emotional validation can look and sound a bunch of different ways, but we, again, wanted to give you all some more tangible things to say. Um, so this might mean providing that basic understanding, um, that empathetic response to see that you're connecting with that person. So it can look like, I understand which, why you would feel that way. That makes sense. I don't blame you. And you might, again, remember that you might be the first person to tell some, the survivor that they're not to blame for what happened to them, right? Um, we know that um, not everyone that we are around in our, in our social circles are equipped to provide that emotional support, but we are. So it's important to let survivors know that whatever happened to them is not their fault. Um, that's understandable. Uh, and when someone is telling us something that bad that happened to them, it's okay to appropriate it. Like, that's terrible, yeah. Like that's really difficult, that's hard. Um, and that might provide that support that someone's needing. Um, and also to, again, validate them that they're, we're going through a unique time in COVID and it's okay to not know how to feel because none of us have been through this before. And it might be um, a very um, anxious situation for some people. For some people, emotional support might look like validating how they're responding or how they're emotionally feeling about the situation. Um, so if someone says to you like, have you heard this before? Like, I feel like this, um, this is what's happening to me. And if you haven't, 
it's okay to tell that person, um, I haven't heard that before, but that doesn't make it any less true. It makes sense to me. Because even if their experience is unique and it's something like you've never heard before, that doesn't make what's happening to them any less true or any less valid. Um, we also want to remind people, again, that how they're getting through this and how they're coping with it is the right way for them. Um, there's no right way to deal with this. There's no manual. There's no manuscript. Um, and they're doing what they can to survive, and that is um, the best option. And then for some people, it might help them to know that other people are feeling, are going through are experiencing similar things to them. Um, so talking about, I've heard so many things from other survivors. I've heard that for a lot of survivors, they're having a hard time sleeping at night during this time. Um, we know that social distancing can bring up feelings of anxiety and uncertainty. And even if some people's uh, experiences are similar, we know that no two survivors experience the exact same thing. So we also just wanna reassure survivors of that as well. Some more shorter or quicker things you can say. Remember, we don't always have to say a whole lot. And when we're listening, we shouldn't be saying a whole lot. It might be these shorter things to just show, again, that you're validating what they're saying. I believe you. Thank you for trusting me. Uh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Thank you for calling me. Um, and it's not your fault this happened to you, but I'm glad that you're reaching out for help now. Again, whatever, um, and you feel out for yourself what sounds the most comfortable for you. Because again, not all of these make sense for us. And the more we practice them, however, the better we'll sound, the more natural it'll be for us. And um, the more common regulated that we'll be able to be on these calls. So some other things you could say um, could look like, I can't tell you what to do, but we can go over your options together. Um, sometimes when people call um, or want virtual advocacy, they are looking for um, someone to help them decide what the best option is, but it's not our job to dictate or decide um, decisions for survivors. It's your job to provide these options and help them work through them. Um, again, we wanna make sure that we're providing this non-judgmental support. So even if a survivor does something that we might not typically um, choose to do, that's okay. We're there to support that decision. Um, and also letting them know that even if they felt like they didn't do anything productive throughout the day or they didn't do whatever what they see other people doing, um, that this is not a productivity contest and whatever you need to get through the day, even if that's just breathing, is enough. Uh, we also want to let them know about our services and why that our hotline is going to be available for them whenever they want to talk. So even if it's not you, letting them know that our services are here on 24-7. If you want to call back later tonight or if you want to discuss something later, you can think about it, feel free to call back later. Uh, one of the skills and roles that we talked about a little earlier was recognizing strength in survivors. And again, we talked about um, even some of those basic things that we might not think of as um, life-changing, life-altering are still strengths. So we can highlight with survivors their, brave and, their bravery, their resiliency, um, their open-mindedness. If they told you that they've been spinning around in circles, um, for two minutes a day in their apartment just to keep their mind off things, that's very creative and we can um, let survivors know that and recognize that strength. Um, and their assertiveness, um, if someone seems like they are being very short on the phone and they're just repeating again what they want over and over again, that shows that they're assertive and they can assess what their needs are and they can also advocate for those needs. So that's another strength we recognize. Again, we have to look for these strengths and be creative ourselves in um, how we interact with survivors during this time. Um, so this might look like um, you got up this morning, you brushed your teeth, and you called your helpline. Those are all things that are that you did, and that's great. Those are first steps. We can talk about some more steps that you can take tomorrow if that would make you feel better. Um, look at all the ways you've grown. Um, this might be more appropriate for a survivor that you've been working with for with a long time. So when we first started talking, we first started working together, um, you were able to make eye contact with me. But now, um, sitting on this video screen for 30 minutes, we've been having a full-blown conversation and maintain eye contact this entire time. This is so great. Look, um, and you're making, um, you're growing and changing, even during this time of such uncertainty. So again, changing and tailoring to whoever you're, whoever that caller or whoever the survivor might be. Um, and finding that, and using that strength-based approach is a part of trauma-informed care. 
Um, so another way to provide options is talking about Ah, okay, excuse me, I forgot the, how this um, slide works. Um, so when we're talking about providing options, this before we were talking about kind of the assessing part, now we're talking about kind of how to respond and how to um, provide some of these skills and resources to survivors. So this might look like assessing some other um, emotional supports. So have you thought about talking to your family or friends? Did you feel supported by them? Was it helpful to talk to them? Because again, we want survivors to still feel supported after they um, get off the phone or after our advocacy session has ended with them. Um, so that might mean um, talking and helping them reach out to some of the emotional supports they have or seeing what emotional supports might not be helpful and also safety planning about that. Um, so this might be also for the next one, talking about some of the, um, naming some of the emotions that they might be feeling. So it could look like um, working through some of those feelings that they might be having. And for some survivors, naming these feelings might be very helpful for them because they might have said, huh, I never thought about that before. I knew that I was um, having trouble breathing. I knew that I was very short tempered, but I didn't recognize that as frustration before. So when you name those things, that might be very helpful to survivors and that could also lead to some more resources. And we also wanna make sure that we're following up with um, our services, and even if the survivor says, oh wait, like I forgot to tell them about this, that they can call back anytime. There's no um, expiration date on our services and they're always available to them. And we also want to let them know that even if they don't, um, even if the, some of the resources and skills that you talked about, they don't use or um, whatever decisions that they make um, beyond talking to you, um, that we're still supporting them no matter what, even if it's something that we personally wouldn't do ourselves again, that non-judgmental support that we want to show everyone. A really big and important one for us is that we don't want to judge how someone makes it through their day, right? Um, so we are not the CDC. Um, we should not be dictating or um, shaming people for how they are surviving during this time. Um, so are you not wearing a face mask? Um, even if we might say, well, the CDC says, and this is best practice for social distancing, um, it's not our job to judge people for how they're doing it. We don't know what is the best and most safest option for each and every person. Um, so we should really focus on providing that non-judgmental support and helpful strategies instead of things that we might, instead of focusing on things that we might consider as negative. Don't do this. So some other um, useful tips that we wanted to just make sure that were highlighted. Um, we wanna make sure that we're paying attention to the caller's name, if they provided it, um, and their pronouns. Um, again, we don't ever wanna assume someone's gender, so it's very important that we're asking this um, initially during um, our interactions. We also wanna make, uh, make sure that we are explaining confidentiality and mandatory reporting. And again, we wanna do this um, near the start of our conversations because we don't want someone to feel tricked or like they didn't know this um, important information that they might not have disclosed to us if they hadn't known these things. Um, we also wanna make sure that we're mirroring the terms that survivors use as appropriate. So this might look like if someone says, um, I'm having problems and I'm stuck in the house with my baby daddy. We don't want to, we don't want to change that and rephrase it as, oh, so I hear you're having problems with your partner because that might not be the relationship. So we want to make sure that we are using um, what survivor says and mirroring these terms. Uh, we also want to make sure when we're listening, we're taking account of everything that's going on. So if a survivor started off talking, they were very talking very loud, they were using a lot of expressions, they were maybe um, slipping into Spanish, and then near the end, they were only using short sentences, they were only speaking English, in English and they were only speaking quietly. Uh, we want to make sure and take into account that maybe something in their environment has changed, and we want to now um, shift and focus on that. And then we also want to remind survivors, again, that this is new, this is unprecedented, and it's okay not to be okay and not to have it all together right now. Um, none of us know how to get through this, and it's okay to be authentic with survivors and say, you know, I've been also having a difficult time in this situation, but we can all get through this together. So what does recognizing distress over the phone look like? 
for some people, it looks like a change in tone. So if someone is speaking, um, if someone and their tone is very short, but then during the end of the call, they're, you know, using more expressions and their tone has deepened, that might show that they move from a place of anxiety or nervousness to being a little bit more calm. So there a lot of um, our communication, 90% of it actually um, is nonverbal. So these are some ways that we can Pay attention to how someone is communicating, maybe distress or a change in emotion to us. Um, volume is a very good indicator. If they started off talking where you could hear them, but at the end of the conversation, you notice that they were whispering, this might be a, um, indicate another change in their environment that you could ask them about possibly. Uh, pacing is another very big one. For some people, myself included, um, when I am nervous, I tend to talk a little bit faster, but when I'm more calm, when I'm more regulated, you can definitely tell that in the pacing of my voice and my tone um, because it's a little bit more relaxed. Uh, breathing is another big indicator. So if someone is having trouble breathing, that might even be a time to introduce one of the grounding activities and help them focus on their breathing. So that might say, might look like um, taking deep breath in, holding it for two seconds, releasing it for two seconds, breathing back in for two seconds. And again, that helps regulate their breathing and it might show that help a person move from distress to being calm and then frustration. Um, again, validating that. Like, I I feel like you're very frustrated right now. Um, is there anything I can do? And even if they say no, that's okay. Um, but that shows that you're listening and recognizing what they're going through and you're still there to help them through it, even if they're frustrated. Because more than likely, they're not frustrated with you, um, but they're still frustrated at their situation, and we are there to help, not to judge how they're dealing with it. And remember, um, you all are already great advocates, and you're already good at providing that emotional support anyway, but we just wanna make sure that we all remember that listening is a skill. And for a lot of survivors, it might be the only thing that we can help with during this time. Um, so we just have to practice it. And you all are doing a great job at that already. All right, um, so before we get into some of these tips, um, one thing I wanted to make sure we mention is that I know we've gone through a lot of ways to, to validate survivors during this time, but I also wanna take the time to validate you as advocates, right? Like this time is not easy for any of us and it's okay if you're having bad days too, um, right? Like, so I really wanna make sure um, to emphasize that we also need to be practicing self-care during this time. And we, um, I, I know a lot of us want to be helping people um, and some of that action makes us feel a little bit better about the situation, um, but it's also okay to take time for yourself. Um, and if you're having some ups and downs, it's okay um, to take breaks and to work with coworkers, um, right? For example, um, I think, I think it was maybe the second week that we were teleworking. I was having just a really bad week. Um, and I was just like losing it over everything. And I had a meeting that day and I was like, hey, Lachey, can you attend this meeting without me? Like, is, is that okay? Cause like, I don't think I can do the meeting um, because I really needed to take like 30 minutes to just like regulate myself and calm down. Um, and she did the meeting without me. Um, and so I really appreciate that. So really um, collaborating with your coworkers um, when you're feeling these stresses as well is really, really important. All right, so now we'll go to the next slide um, and get into some tips about some of those phone conversations. Um, and we're gonna go over like a few sample scripts. Um, obviously, you're gonna wanna adapt these um, to whatever's most comfortable for you. Uh, but one of the first things is we wanna make sure we're answering the phone in a clear and warm tone. Um, I don't know about you all, but um, if you've ever called anyone um, either on a hotline of any kind or just like a business that you're trying to get a hold of, like maybe your cable internet provider, right? And they sound like super grumpy. Um, they don't want to talk to you or like maybe they just woke up. Um, I think that communicates a lot right away about who you're talking to and if they're going to be able to help you or not. Um, and the same goes for our helplines, right? Like if we aren't paying attention to the way we're answering the phone, um, we might be unintentionally communicating that we don't wanna talk right now. 
Um, and so it's important that we um, answer the phone um, and not seem like we're in a bad mood or uh, we're upset. And we wanna make sure that we're showing we're a safe person and that we're calm. Um, it's also important for us to control our breathing, our tone and volume. Um, right, like I'm someone who tends to speak quickly. Um, and so when I'm on the phone or doing a webinar or presenting, I always need to make sure that I am slowing my breathing down um, and making sure to speak clearly and not super quickly. Um, next slide. Uh, we want to check in about safety, um, and this can be one of the first things that we do. Um, so you could say, I'm so glad you called. Do you have a good amount of time to talk um, about your question, or should I be quick, right? Like we can ask um, if people have time to talk, or maybe they just have five minutes, right? They're going out to check the mail, and that's the only safe time that they have. Um, and so they might want something really quick in that uh, five minutes that they're checking the mail. Um, and always let them know that if they get cut off or if they need to hang up unexpectedly, that's totally fine. Like you're not gonna be offended if they need to hang up. Um, their safety is more important um, than them just hanging up on you. Uh, and let them know that you can call, that they can call back um, to your helpline um, and that it's 24 hours if it is, um, and that they can always reach someone if they need to talk to someone. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one way you can start is to introduce yourself in your program. So this is especially helpful for like a first time caller um, because sometimes uh, first time callers, they might um, have gotten your number, uh, like the helpline number and they're calling, uh, but they really aren't sure how to begin the conversation or what to say. Um, or maybe um, they've called and they've kind of blanked out on, um, what you all do and why they're calling. So you could always say, hi there, my name's Victoria. Um, can you tell me about uh, why you've called today? Uh, we're the local sexual and domestic violence service provider. We offer supportive and healing services for survivors of violence. I'm here to help you in any way I can. Uh, one of those services is providing support over the phone. Right, and so reminding the caller of the services that you provide can help um, remind them of either what, what they wanted to talk about um, uh, when, when they call, if they're kind of blanking. Uh, next slide. Um, so sometimes uh, when survivors call, either if it's the first time or maybe it's like the 10th time they're talking to you, um, they might have difficulty starting off um, and so that's okay. Um, and we can make sure they know that it's okay by letting them know and validating that silence. Um, so you can say, I want you to know I'm really comfortable with silence. So if it takes a few minutes to figure out where to start, that's okay. Right. And then make sure that you do allow that space um, for the silence to happen um, and that you're not trying to fill that silence. Uh, you can also say, I've done this type of work for a while. Uh, you can feel free to tell me as much or as little as you like, right? Sometimes I think folks think they need to tell you their entire story um, for you to provide services to them. And we know as advocates, that's not true. Um, they just, um, they can tell us whatever they want to tell us and we're just here uh, to support no matter what. All right, next slide, please. Um, so we also have a few suggestions on ways to begin or restart a conversation, right? So maybe the survivor's not sure where to begin, or maybe um, that silence has been going on um, uh, for a pretty long time. Um, and so maybe you're like, maybe they need some prompting or some questions to really get started. Um, so you could always ask, what's coming up for you right now that caused you to reach out? Um, or you could say, do you want to tell me a little bit about how you're feeling right now? Or what are you thinking about at this moment? Uh, right, so all of these questions could um, help that survivor um, get started or get restarted uh, during your conversation. Uh, next slide, please. And then always remind them they can call back at any time. Um, and so in this scenario, we have maybe someone called in the middle of the night because they couldn't sleep. Um, maybe they're having nightmares or something. Um, and so this person says, 
I'm so glad you're feeling ready to go back to sleep. Just know I'm here all night. If you need to call again, I will be here. Um, right, so if you're not gonna be there all night, obviously you would wanna modify that and let them know that they'll probably talk to someone else. Um, you could also say, I want you to know that even though we talked today, you're still always able to call our 24 hour helpline anytime you want. Um, reminding them that they can call the helpline anytime um, can be very important and helpful for survivors, right? Um, something that sometimes we forget about is that our helpline is a service. Um, and because all, um, obviously all of us, we can't work 24 hours a day. That's why we have a team of people that we work with. Um, to provide that 24 hour coverage. Um, and we might feel like we want, or like we need to do it all, um, but reminding them that they have other options that they can call uh, when they can't get hold of you can be super helpful. And you could always say something like, the person answering the line most likely won't be me, but whoever answers uh, is there to support you. A lot of people I talk uh, with call the helpline when they're having nightmares or particularly hard moments. I want you to know that you can call our helpline anytime to process or maybe just to get validation. That's what our helpline's for, right? Um, and so letting them know that they can call at any time. Uh, next slide. Okay. And then we have a little bit uh, about ongoing advocacy. So maybe uh, before COVID-19 started or maybe after COVID-19 started, you've been having regular appointments um, with different uh, survivors um, uh, regarding their advocacy, right? Um, but you've had to make them all virtual now. Um, and so it can be important to address um, how COVID-19 is affecting the way that you are working. Um, like maybe what services have changed? Are you having virtual support groups um, now? Um, do you have any other virtual services you can offer? Um, how is court accompaniment um, looking uh, right now? How is medical accompaniment looking right now? Whatever the survivor's needs are, uh, be sure to address them and how COVID-19 has changed the way that you're potentially supporting them. Uh, but definitely let them know that even though things have been changing, that you can still support them. Um, another thing you could do, um, and I would only suggest doing this if you have a work cell phone number, right? So um, if, um, if Typically, you've had survivors call you at your direct office line. Um, if you have a work phone that you can turn off and on when you're on the clock, um, you could give them your work cell phone number. Um, if you don't have a work cell phone number, I would not suggest doing this, um, just because it's important to maintain those boundaries, um, even though, um, e even when we're working from home, um, because it can be even harder to maintain boundaries when working from home. Um, you can also let them know what hours you're available. So if they really want to talk to you um, instead of calling the helpline, for instance, like maybe they have like a strong connection with you and they feel comfortable talking to you, um, let them know what hours you're available to talk if they need to. Um, and then again, referring them to your helpline is always important. All right, next slide. Um, again, do your best to adapt. Um, like, so you could use any of these script options. You could make your own kind of tentative script. Um, I know that can be helpful for me if I have like kind of a general outline of things that I wanna make sure I'm covering. Uh, but make sure you're still being authentic during that interaction and you're adapting um, whatever you're saying to something that is natural for you to say. So um, obviously I didn't write all of those scripts. I think I wrote like two of them. Um, that I just read. And so I kind of was adapting them as I was saying them um, because that's not always the way I would say something. Um, and so make sure to adapt it to something that you would say and adapting it to the survivor you're speaking to, right? Because people can tell when you're talking um, from a script or when you're kind of going through a checklist of things to cover. All right, next slide. Um, some suggestions of things that you might want to have while you're on a call. Um, so having your, uh, if you have an information binder with like referrals and all of that um, that you typically use, or um, if you're like me and you kind of use like a spreadsheet um, for that sort of thing, um, 
have that um, pulled up and available to you um, during the call because you might not, uh, you might get a question that you're not totally expecting or totally familiar with and you need to look, look it up in your resources. Um, having writing materials, right? So having a notebook um, where you, you are jotting down things that you might need. Um, as a reminder, it is best practice to keep minimal notes. Um, when you're providing advocacy, but sometimes um, you might need to do additional research, like they have a question um, and you're not sure if that particular resource is still open right now during COVID-19. Um, and so you'll need to make a note of it, right, to go research it later. Um, but making sure that you're taking minimal notes and you're storing them um, or disposing of them properly is very important, even though uh, we're, we're not in the office. Um, you may find having fidgets or other focus objects uh, around useful, right? Like I know a lot of folks have heard of fidget spinners, uh, but you can use everyday objects like, um, like a scrunchie or a hair tie. Um, I am guilty of pulling on those too hard and breaking them. I also do that with my pens. Like I break the, uh, um, the clips off pens because I'm fidgeting with them. Um, and so ideally having something that you're not gonna break um, would be good. <laughs> Um, but you probably do have some everyday items around that you can use. Um, you could also have a mirror on hand. So a mirror, uh, you might be like, what's that for? Um, a mirror can be helpful for um, keeping your tone um, and your facial expressions kind of regulated. So sometimes our facial expressions can guide um, the tone that we have on the phone, even if we're not really realizing it. Um, and so making sure that um, our facial expressions are kind of the facial expressions that we would want to be um, giving a survivor in person um, could help um, us regulate our own tone um, in a way um, that could be really helpful over the phone. Uh, you might want to have a drink, like having some water um, or tea or coffee. Um, whatever it is that you typically um, are drinking uh, during the day, during the work day, um, because that can help you uh, if you are talking too fast or um, need to take a minute to drink some water to ground yourself, um, that can be super helpful. Um, and you could also have some quotes, um, like potentially like some sample things that you might want to say or um, some inspirational quotes that keep, keep you inspired during the day um, can also be useful to have um, just around you during the call. All right, next slide. Okay, so we talked about how to provide emotional validation um, and some, some tips around that. So we are gonna cover a little bit on emotional safety planning. So, um, Emotional safety planning really focuses on um, feeling safe in your own body and in your own mind, right? So, so it's expanding beyond the, the physical, um, maybe um, safety planning and making sure you're safe from, you know, someone that's harming you. Um, and emotional safety planning is, is really about, um, you know, how to recognize and accept emotions you're feeling, um, right? Have self-compassion for yourself. Um, and creating some strategies to get through those intense emotions that survivors often have and might be feeling. Next slide. So of course, um, we know that safety planning, um, physical and emotional, um, should be individualized and tailored to each person. So again, um, through this whole webinar, you've heard us say that context is everything. Um, and so, so please keep that in mind when you're utilizing some of these tools and some of these scripts um, to, to tailor it to yourself and what feels comfortable for you and what's appropriate for the people that you're working with. Assess what the caller needs in the moment and some possible future needs. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. And then um, again, a reminder that safety planning should always include um, both physical and emotional needs of survivors, right? Next slide. So we have some specific safety planning questions um, that could be useful for you and the clients that you work with during COVID-19. 
Um, and so we're going to go through a couple of these. So the first one is what does safety mean to you specifically during this time, right, of COVID-19? Because it could look a little bit different. Um, they might be quarantining. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's our job as advocates to talk through what they need and what they, what they need to feel safe and what they need to know to feel safe. Um, and that's something that we can help um, kind of talk through um, those things with survivors and help them um, maybe learn some new tools, strategies, um, and some coping techniques to, to feel safe um, where they're at in their body, right? Um, what do others need to know um, to, to help you feel safe? And maybe that means people you're quarantining with. Um, so maybe um, a college student um, who was sexually assaulted when she was a child um, is going back to their childhood home, right? Um, and so maybe that is talking through, um, you know, hopefully there, there are safe people in, in their home um, to talk through, um, you know, if, if they start feeling triggered, um, how others around them can help. Um, um, is really important. Talking about what helps them feel calm, right? What helps you feel like yourself? Um, what helps you feel strong and secure and safe? Who are your safe people, right? Um, you know, we, we have our helpline that you can call 24 seven um, and, right, who are, who are people that you can reach out to um, when you're, you're feeling anxious or when you're feeling triggered? Um, what makes you feel unsafe, right? Like kind of um, recognizing those triggers um, in order for us to, to work through them together. Talking about how, um, what coping skills they have already um, and what has helped them um, through some hard times. Um, talking about, you know, do you wanna talk um, about some techniques that might um, be helpful and might help you feel grounded or safe, right? So, um, you know, we can, we can provide those techniques and skills um, to survivors. Next slide. So we created um, a grounding toolkit to, to help guide the conversation between advocates and survivors, and also with um, that survivors can utilize, as well as advocates, right, really anyone, um, to, to help facilitate this process of feeling safe and grounded. Um, so Lachey, if you want to open up the toolkit, um, we can kind of skim through that. Thank you. Um, so it's best if you have a printer um, uh, to, if you want to print this out, print it out as a booklet um, and you will be able to cut it and staple it together and, and, and it creates kind of like a book for, for you. So it really opens up with talking about what are grounding size, uh, exercises. So what is the purpose of grounding exercises, right? They can be, they can be helpful in managing feelings of um, feeling overwhelmed, um, those gut-wrenching feelings of fear and anxiety um, to, to help regulate that person, come back, and, come back into the present, right, um, and to be mindful. You can go down, Lachey. Thank you. So this toolkit is really um, categorized into physical grounding, mental grounding, grounding and soothing. Um, and so the physical grounding is focusing on your, your body, your sensations. Um, mental grounding is focusing on um, your mind. And then soothing is really focused on um, being able, able to soothe, soothe yourself. Um, I often think the soothing is a lot of the self-care um, techniques um, that we might think of. So we're um, kind of going to go through a couple of these. You can scroll down. Thank you. We have some tips. Um, you, you all can read those. Those are, those are important. Um, I will point out the probably the most um, important thing, as it says, is to be kind to yourself, um, you know, th throughout this whole experience um, um, and really, you know, throughout um, your, your survivorship and, and the journey is to remember and to remind survivors of self-compassion and, and being kind to yourself. All right, so we have some physical grounding techniques. You can keep going down, Lachey. So we have some exercises. So we have some breathing exercises, um, running cool or warm water on your hands um, to um, engage that sense of touch um, and that temperature. Um, stretching. You can go down the side. Thank you. Uh, we have a breathing exercise. Um, and you know, if you, if you have some breathing exercises, I would recommend um, 
you know, letting survivors know, you know, th this is what I use, right? I use square breathing. It's helpful for me. Do you want to try it out together? Um, I think um, what's really important um, is to us as advocates practice these things um, because it's going to feel more authentic to talk about um, things that you have tried, right? So I've tried this square breathing. You know, you could say it's really hard for me to hold uh, my breath for four seconds. So, you know, I, I do two seconds and that feels good to me, right? I listen to my body um, and, and that's what it's about, it's about listening to your body and, and feeling comfortable. You can go down, Lachey. All right. Some more exercises, Lachey, if you want to go down to the mental, we can skip down to the mental. There we go. Um, so here are some uh, mental grounding exercises. It's really focused on um, staying in uh, the present, right? So describing your environment in detail. So this could help survivors, again, really um, kind of come back to where they are, right? Um, hopefully um, it's in that, that safe physical space, even if it's, um, you know, um, outside in nature, right? Maybe they're taking a walk. So um, to ground themselves, they can start describing everything they see in detail. So, um, you know, I am looking at really tall trees. Um, they have some white flowers that are budding that look really nice. Um, I also am looking at a golf course that's behind my house. Um, I see people playing golf, really just um, focusing on, on the present. You can continue, Lachey. Do you want to go down to, to soothing? Thank you. So again, um, I, I think for, for, for me, what kind of rings true is to the, to the um, soothing is utilizing um, different senses um, and, and more of those traditional um, self-care techniques that we might think of. Um, and so it is, you know, maybe looking at some of your favorite um, quotes or poems or giving yourself a hug, right? Soothe, soothe, um, soothing yourself through touch um, could be really helpful for survivors. Um, smelling your favorite scent, right? So um, I know um, some folks have like a, a, a grounding box or, um, you know, tools that they carry around with them, maybe in their purse or their backpack, um, or maybe they put, um, you know, um, lo a mini lotion in their pocket um, to utilize those senses um, to, to make them, to help them feel grounded. Um, and so, so I do know folks that, that kind of have that. Um, I know for me, I have um, citrus um, essential oil in my purse. Um, that was really helpful for me um, in, in feeling comfortable. You can go down, Lachey. All right, so, so again, just continuing that self-compassion and um, those um, positive affirmations could be helpful for survivors. And then some resources. So again, um, please feel free to spread this far and wide. Um, some of this, right, might, might be might be helpful for clients and survivors that you work with. Um, they might really like one exercise that comes out of this, and that's great. Um, they they can certainly pick and choose what they want. Um, the second thing that I just really want to run through is the grounding worksheet. So this grounding worksheet really um, is a good tool to use with the toolkit. Um, and so it's really about making your own toolkit, right? So, so taking those physical techniques that a survivor learned in the toolkit and then putting uh, writing on paper what um, has worked for them. So if they're feeling overwhelmed, if they're feeling triggered, um, they can literally have this in their back pocket to, to pull out and, and remind them of some strategies and some techniques that they can utilize to, to, to come back to the present, ground themselves, um, and, and continue, um, you know, hopefully feeling safe. If you have any additional questions on these toolkits or worksheets, please feel free to reach out to us um, and we can definitely talk more about it. So, Lachey, if you want to go back to the PowerPoint. So, the last thing we want to mention um, is some different healing options and way to keep the mind occupied during this time. So um, for some survivors, um, it's about connecting with others and feeling that connectedness with their community and with their community of fellow survivors. Um, and so there are virtual support groups um, that are available in Arizona. Um, again, I believe um, some of those are on our um, website. 
um, on our COVID landing page. If not, again, feel free to reach out to us um, and we will let you all know some of the support groups that we know of that have gone virtual um, here in Arizona. Um, they could engage in, you know, puzzling, again, keeping the mind occupied. Um, I know I just started puzzling and the day seems to go by a little bit quicker. Um, knitting, um, you know, even just dancing and singing and, and, and feeling, that, feeling that joy in that moment, um, you know, is really important. Going outside, nature is, um, you know, um, really healing for some folks. Um, and so reminding them, right? So, you know, I, I know you used to go hiking all the time um, and you might not feel safe doing that right now, but is there a space outside that, that you can go um, and take a walk, right? Or go for a jog, um, that, that's really helpful. Um, maybe some trauma sensitive yoga. Um, there are some free online um, yoga classes going on right now. I believe we posted them um, on our um, social media. Um, but if not, we definitely posted it in another one of our toolkits um, that you can find on our website. Um, I believe it's the, the self-care um, toolkit. Um, and those are still going on, I believe. Next slide. So um, we want to just kind of end, um, we want to remind you all that you're doing a, a, an amazing job. There are some additional resources um, on um, the Resource Sharing Project's website um, that we pull some of this information from. Um, they have a great hotline training or a hotline uh, mini toolkit um, that is a, could be a really good resource for you all. So feel free to check that out. And that, there we go. <laughs> so there are our email addresses. Um, again, Lindsay, Victoria, and Lachey. Um, are the Sexual Violence Response Department, and then we also have the Domestic Violence Response Department, um, Doreen, Sam, and Ruby, um, if you have domestic violence uh, related questions. So again, thank you for, for listening. I hope this was helpful. Um, keep up the good work. Um, you know, we are um, experiencing a uh, different time right now. Um, but we are here for you, and please, please reach out um, if you all um, need support. Thank you.